for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is jeweler Ricardo Basta and artist Gay Rabisi. Ricardo Basta is a third generation jewelry designer who was born and raised in Argentina. Did you have a choice of what career you wanted? Yeah, actually, my grandfather wanted me to be a dentist. Oh, this, is, yeah. this isn't so far from yeah. dentistry, is right. it? <laughs> Pretty much the same tools. Uh -huh, yeah. So, so what happened? Well, I came to visit my uncle, which he was here in the United States, and uh, he introduced me to the jewelry industry, and uh, I decided that I liked it. Uh, so I went back to Argentina, I did my service in the military, and I came back. And I stayed. Oh, this is then. where you learned? I learned here in the United States. So you yeah. really, I mean, being a dentist is one thing, but with three generations of jewelers and mm -hmm. all that background, were you around jewelry all the time? Uh, not really, because really? My, my uncle um, was the jeweler, and uh, he had the jewelry shop here in the United States. Oh. So I came here and I learned the jewelry here. And it's an interest, interest, interesting story because... Uh, we had it at the time. My uncle had a shop with about fifteen employees, and they were all good jewelers. And he stopped production, and he introduced me to everybody. And he said that, "Do you want to be a jeweler?" And I say, "Yes." <laughs> you want to learn from the ground up? And I say, "Yes." Well, grab the fr the broom, start sweeping the floor. Oh, grab the broom! <laughs> grab the broom, start sweeping the floor, and that's how I started learning the trade. Is that right? That's so right. So you knew how to put together a showroom then, or a workroom, I guess. Right, right. Uh, and, and it's very important because you have filings that uh, drop on the floor, and you have to know that you have to uh, collect that and send it to the refiner. Oh, is that right? right. So nothing gets lost? Well... I mean, but... Uh, yeah. It can yeah. be recycled? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We send everything to the, uh, to the refiner. You know, one of the things I was reading about, you were talking about this little brush, mm -hmm. uh, like cleaning the jewelry mm -hmm. with a little brush, and you knew you have to know a certain way how to... Right. The, the brush will, will uh, loosen the dirt, but it's not going to remove it. To remove it, you need the steam unit, I which see. it has eight pounds per, uh, 80 pounds per square inch of pressure. Is that of right? Steam. Yeah. Well, once you got here and you learned how to sweep the floor, right. then, as the jewelers say, you worked at the bench. What does that actually mean? Well, I was in charge of uh, making, uh, well, first I, I took many years into learning. Then I started carving waxes and, uh, and handcraft uh, many of, of uh, the designs that the customers were uh, bringing in. And then, Around nine, 1982, I started working directly with Francis Klein. Oh, yes, uh, the antique jeweler on Rodeo. Right. Francis Klein was, at, at that time, was nobody better uh, than Francis Klein in antique jewelry. And she was an expert. And I got the honor to work directly with her. Uh, and at the same time, I learned about period jewelry because uh, oh. she loved all periods of jewelry, and so do I. That's w where I get my inspiration. I, I, my favorite areas are the Victorian, Edwardian, and Deco periods. Oh, I was going to ask you because your work is reminiscent of old pieces, and right. it, it has an overlay of something, right. and that's in your background. Right. Is it important for the designer? who designs the piece to actually be able to make the goods or uh, do they? It's, it's important because a lot of designers, they, they just know how to draw. Yeah. But if, if the designer will draw, if, if, if they do three different pictures of the same piece, they design three different rings. They if, don't realize that. No. They, they, they say, well, I want 
the side view to be like this, I want the top view to be like that. Uh-huh. And 90% of the times, you can't do it. Oh, you you could you could do the side view by itself, and you can do the top view by itself, but it doesn't blend into one ring. Oh, so it needs a it needs a craftsman. Right, right. I see. I see. Did you study stones? Um, the on and off, yes. I'm not a gemologist, but I I know um, quite a bit of of uh, about stones. Because I think your work really revolves around important stones, colored stones, and uh, right. And right. so I wondered if you had I, a particular longing for stones. I like vivid colors. Oh. Uh, I, I adore having vivid colors. I, I love jade. Uh, I love specertite garnet. Uh, that's a specertite garnet. What is specertite? What is that uh, That's in the family of the, of the garnets. It looks like it's on fire. Yes. It's so it's, beautiful. It's a beautiful. And it's a funny story with this stone because uh, my wife bought it for herself. Just the stone? Just the stone. Some, uh, she, she saw the stone, she fell in love with it, and she bought it for herself. And one day I was making um, things to send to the Spectrum uh, competition, and I saw the stone, and I, and I got the, the design in my mind. So I took the stone, and I made the, the ring, and I sent it uh, to the competition, and it won first place. This one, do you think it was yeah. because of the stone or because of the design? I'm going to take it uh, off because the design is like, it has a square bottom. Well, the, the, the so judging beautiful. is on, on the design and the quality of the design and the quality of the manufacturing. I think you have gotten a lot of um, awards, and I think this necklace was an award winner. Yeah, this is uh, 17 and a half carats of all natural color diamonds, and uh, this necklace uh, just won a, a Spectrum Award also. It's um, hard to tell, but they're all different color diamonds. Right. They, you have pinks and you have blues and you have yellows and orange. And uh, uh, this necklace also was worn by uh, R&B singer Eureka uh, for her new album. She, she, do, she did all the, the, the photo shoots with these and some other pieces. Of do mine. you loan a lot of your jewelry to celebrities? I never did before. But, but I'm, I'm starting now. It's kind of neat to yeah, see your work. Yeah, out there. Right, um, right. One of the things: does the stone dictate what you're going to do, or do you, or do you look for a stone to fit your um, design? It works either way with me. Uh, this, some this. people, some people have the, the the stones, and then they come up with the design, and that's the only way it works. With me, uh, I might uh, invent a, a, a system. A, a technique how to make a, a, a spinning ring perhaps uh -huh. and I evolved the design around the engineering oh but this is a stone talk about this, this yeah this pair. is a, a drusy quartz it is in the family of the agate and the, the small stones are damantoid the green ones uh, diamonds and special type garnets did you Build it around this stone, or yeah, did, did you decide some, on a pair, or what? Right, that's we. I found the 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 stones first, and then we designed it. I want to show how it looked um, on the Rob Report cover. Oh yeah, here's here's the picture that you took, and then here's how they showed it on the pair. Yeah, it it, it was a very art artistically done Wasn't picture. Wasn't it really yeah, they, beautiful? They even put a little bee in there. It's beautiful. And then here's the stone. This is the piece that we have. Right. You have won so many awards. And is it all for design or is it for the quality uh, of the stones it's, as well? It's both. It's uh, designing and manufacturing. Oh, and manufacturing. It's, it's, a, it's a whole concept. It's not just one thing. They're the whole, the whole finished product. One of the other interesting things, you've brought so many beautiful things, is this animal. Dragon? Oh, oh, oh. I dropped the dragon. That's Can you okay. get it? The dragon jumped away from me. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm going to hold the dragon here so we can see it. And then you have um, the process. As soon as we see the dragon here, so that I don't drop it again. And then, oh, you have. Okay, we have this, first we, we do uh, a clay impression. This is it. 
or actually it's wax, we wax. carve it and then we put clay to modify whatever we think it needs to modify. Then we do a refined version and then we cast it. In this, this case, is, I cast in it in silver. Th this is silver. And this is silver. Mm -hmm. And then it comes out in the long run after you've set all the stones right, right. like that. And this particular pin has uh, elephant hair for the hair. Oh my gosh, ivory, oh I see it. Ivory for uh, the horns, tamanto Daman garnet for the eyes and onyx, and fire opal for the, f the fire, and regular diamonds for the main. You have um, all these Beverly Hills connections and all this Hollywood connect connection. Mm -hmm. One of your pieces was worn at the Academy Awards one year. S yeah, several pieces. Tell, yeah. tell us one of the funny stories. Well, uh, one of the pieces that, that uh, it was a piece that was made by Asprey Gerard in oh, London. Yeah, probably 1860s. Oh, really? Yeah, and it was a beautiful, beautiful uh, necklace that they converted to a tiara. And uh, apparently Asprey sold it and then bought it back from the state many, many years later. And they had it in London. And uh, when Hilary Swank won the, the, the Oscar, she wanted something with that description. So they sent it from, from uh, London and I restored it in, in two and a half weeks. I had it ready to go. Is that right? Yeah, and she wore it at the Oscars and everybody had pictures of it and actually I think they sold the, the necklace even before they, they got it back. But the great thing is I think working with someone like that or with Cartier or with um, uh, Schlumberger or any of the people who are jewelers from the past, mm -hmm. you have that feeling of going in and preserving it. Oh yeah. And I've seen a lot of your oh, work yeah. where you've taken Cartier bracelet, watches, and fix the metal work on right. it, and that's very it's difficult. It's a la labor of love. You wrote a book a about doing that. Right. Um, it, it's, uh, it's also an uh, interest, interesting uh, story. The, the guy who actually does the symposium, he started calling me every two weeks that I needed to go and, and do uh, a book about restorations, uh. and, I, and I, I didn't know why he wanted me to go, because I never knew what I knew. <laughs> really, you didn't realize I, how much you knew. I never knew because I I worked only in one shop always and uh, under my uncle's tutelage so I, I never knew what everybody else knew and apparently the Platinum Guild gave the Santa Fe Symposium my name and he called me several times and I said no and then, then one day he said well if you don't do this and you die, nobody's going to know how to repair uh, these antique pieces. He's so that's when he convinced me to actually um, He's do so the right. I'm showing some of your, your pieces as you're talking. Oh. And I thank you so much for coming in today. You're very welcome. Um, I know you have a bridal line. Yes. And I think this is one of the rings from the bridal ri um, line. It's all paved all the way around. Right. And, and there's our dragon, and there's a ring that, as you say, the top has to go with the sides. Right. Ricardo Basta, thank you so much for coming in today. We appreciate you. your being here. Thank you. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Gay Rabisi, who uh, has her work on the set. I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm with artist Gay Rabisi, who was born and raised in Tampa, Florida. She spent two years at the University of Georgia, earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts at the University of Southern Florida, and came to Berkeley for her Master in Fine Arts. Gay's paintings and photographs have been on view and on exhibit uh, all throughout California, right? Right. And you're 
a southern girl because they're going to hear your <laughs> <laughs> they're going to hear your accent. What brought you to Berkeley? The um, excitement of it all, and I was in the '60s. Did you know that then? Yes. <laughs> I knew that there was some more to the world than what I was learning in Tampa, Florida. And I knew that I wanted to experience this, um, what was going on in Berkeley. It was something it, it, very exciting to me. You know, there was the um, riots <laughs> against the war. I mean, it, it, protesting, and it was all very interesting to me because I, I had that, I felt that myself. I felt. But you went as an art major though, right? Yes, I went right from the University of South Florida in Tampa, their Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, and then I um, got a scholarship to Berkeley. Oh, you did? Yeah, so I, I actually had applied to several schools in California because I just liked the movement and the energy that was coming from California. Well then, did you stay here or did you move back to the South? No, I stayed. You stayed. I you have no, I've been back. <laughs> I go to visit once in a while. So do you always want to be an artist, obviously. Uh, obviously, yes. And so what kind of mediums were you working in? Well, when I was very, oh, that's what I did. When I first started going to art school, I took every drawing class I could possibly take. And that's where I was getting my feet wet, so to speak. I really wanted to know where was, uh, where did I belong? I took sculpture classes, I took print making classes, oh, photography did. classes. Best time of my life, by the way. You could, I just created every day, all day. Um, and sculpture, sculpture got my heart. So I started, I started going to junkyards and find and not junkyards piled sky high and I would climb in there and get beautiful metal objects and learned how to weld them together oh. so I did metal sculptures for a long with time with found objects with which I love with found <laughs> objects and um, I just saw some of those slides a um, about two weeks ago when I was going through my things it, those are older pieces and then I w went from that to building be hu huge masonite uh, wooden structures with bent masonite over them and then painting them and fill they would look like um, the surface of an automobile. Oh, so you really did start sculpting before you started painting. And yes. So that was like just this progression. It was. And, and you were painting in the 70s? Yes. Yes. And what did you start painting then? Were you painting abstract? No, I was painting, oh. um, after, after sculpture, yeah. I went into ceramics. Oh, that's right. Ceramics. And, you, and the ceramics won you some kind of an award yes. at the Olympics. Uh, uh, yes, and in conjunction with the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles, they had a huge art competition. And uh, there were over 10,000 entries in ceramics alone. And that's shocking. I won a bronze medal. I know, that's so great. How did so many people find out about it, though? They 10, promoted it. And in, in magazines, art magazines, uh -huh. and they promoted it. Um, so it was it was very interesting. But at that time, I was doing um, this interesting process that I still love, and it is colored clay that I would build into a loaf, and it, like it, it's like um, an ice cream swirl. Uh huh. You know, and oh, you yeah. cut it. Uh -huh. Okay, now these were not abstract. I would actually build the face of a girl with hair and, and a plaid dress on and striped shoes and build this into a loaf. And then the loaf would have to um, cure for about two months. Then I could slice the loaf and then roll it out. And the plate or bowl would be the same on the bottom side as it would on the top side. Did you color your own clay? Yes. And then, was it fired? Was yes. the bowl fired yes. then? Yes, yes, it was did you porcelain. Put, did you, you didn't put a slip on it then or anything, because it was already in the clay. That's right. Oh, so that's an interesting process. And it was, it is. It's dying, it's a dying art. But the interesting thing about that, when you're telling me how you did it, and I and it just reminds me of the pieces that you've done <laughs> underwater. Right. Because they're, they feel like they've been sliced like that, and you've put all the colors into them. Yes. So your photography has come way now from the ceramics to the photography. Well, I started photography in the 60s when I wanted to learn how to photograph my own work. Oh. And there is a very, a, 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 there's a 
technique to that because uh -huh. you, it, it, you can make them look really good. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned photography and then I, I, I've kept photography in my pocket for a long, long time. I take photos constantly. I have a camera with me n normally all the time. So the, 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 I think the interesting thing is the ceramic thing that you did. That's and, very and can you do it with a small kill or do you have to go to a some place to do it? Well, no, well, it's, it's I had my own studio? kiln. Oh, I had my did. own kiln at the time. Um, it's a di honestly, I wanted to say that it's a dying art. I found a lady that does this in North Carolina and um, she had written a book and I grabbed that book and it was just like my Bible because there, when you attach the loaf, putting the building the loaf, mm -hmm. and when you finish, there's a, f a picture. Like I did a, a, a calico cat reaching into a bowl with a goldfish like he's going to, yeah. and there was a ladder back chair there. And all of that was in the loaf in various colors of clay. Yes. And each layer that you mold this loaf into is you have to put vinegar in s oh. to hold it together. Oh. It's sort of uh, the acid in there eats away at the clay and it, m it makes it stay together. But it has to cure for two months before you can even slice but it. But those are that's part of the process that no one would know. If someone were listening to this right now, they, they couldn't do it unless they knew some of these little tricks that you know. That from this little lady in North Carolina. That's so great. The other thing. Be because you're so interested in art and you found her, you made some doc you've made some feature films. Yes, I've produced two feature films. Which were what? Tell me those. I didn't know what they were. Um, um, oh my goodness. It's my daughter wrote co-wrote the first one, which is Some Girls. And the second one, my daughter co-wrote, which is called <laughs> According to Spencer. And um, I think when you produce films, your passion has to be there because that thing takes a life of its own. And the fact that my daughter had co-written these scripts, I, I had the passion. I, I loved seeing her, really her vision come to light. And um, um, they, uh, the, the movie um, Some Girl has been all over cable, so it still plays quite often. But talking about passion, then you made a documentary on homeless artists, which yes. is very fascinating. I know, it seems like I, I um, go all over the place. Yeah, but, but it I, comes I'm, back to what you're really doing. That's right. I mean, I can see the films are with your family, doing that's your family, right. but, but this is your passion about homeless artists. Well, I, I was doing, vi oh, okay, here's how this came about. I was doing I was painting, I was back to oils, back to doing portraits, and I looked at this portrait of my son one night, and I said, you know, a hundred years from now, if I were looking at this painting, I would want to know, how did he talk? How did he sound? What were, what were his body motions? I could tell so much more if I, was he, if he was moving. So I decided, well, we have, you know, you see, so I said, well, we have video. I'm going to go do some three-minute video portraits. Oh. I just made it up. Yeah. And I started doing my family and then I got bored with my family. So I said I'm going to go downtown LA and find some homeless people and let them tell me their stories, 3-minute portraits of these people. Oh, that's what it is. And what I found after, you know, hours and hours and hours of being downtown, I had a friend that would go with me, a guy, cuz it was it's scary. Yeah. It's not it's dangerous actually. But I ended up um, doing these portraits and I would find, I found these artists, one guy who lives on the streets of LA has work in the Smithsonian Institute. He draws pencil drawings that would knock you out. And then I found a drummer that was in big bands in the 80s and he doesn't have any drums anymore because people steal them and whatever so he plays on the street and on the building and on his pants with sticks, he has his sticks. And I found a guy who used to sing for Motown. Oh my God! And these are guys living on the streets, and we called it "Art Among the Ruins." Oh, that's fabulous! And um, and art among the ruins, and then we have art under the ruins, ruins <laughs> under the water. <laughs> under because the water. we have a couple of minutes left. I um, want to talk about. Now we've come to the photo on yeah. photos underwater, and that evolved. Um, just, this is, just tell us the process. I, I, to okay. believe that it's art underwater, tell yeah. us what you put there. I do. I do it in a swimming pool. I drape the swimming pool with big, huge black 
backdrops. And then I go under water with the people and I take a photo and then I come up and we give them notes and then we go down and we take another shot. Oh, that's what you do. Yeah. And um, as you can see, the look water disappears. The yeah. black backdrop makes it look like they're floating in space. And she's like vacuuming. She's vacuuming. I found that vacuum cleaner on the street and said, wouldn't that look good underwater? And then I built a piece around it. It looks great. And, how and that's do you a painting that down? I did. How do you keep her down? We wear weights. Well, I had to go to the dive shop to figure out because at first I didn't realize that we needed weights. And so when I was taking the photograph, my feet would float up into the picture or my... Um backside would float up and they were having trouble staying down so I found weight belts we wear mm -hmm. them what about manipulating it how does a cigarette stay underwater that is a Photoshop thing that I did that's I what I wonder you do manipulate it I a little do bit. a little bit but not not a lot like this is virtually untouched Let's hold this, up because this I one think this is great this is actually my son who is Giovanni Ribisi he's an actor and um, a good one. <laughs> He's a great actor. <laughs> Thank you. And um, he promised me he would dress. I, I did the wardrobe. I spent hours and hours in thrift stores and vintage clothing stores finding just the right outfits for all these. But he gave so much because he was really in character. And you can see it, and the bubbles coming I from his hat. I see the bubbles. The I just can't. I think these photographs are so fabulous, and to th and the idea that they're not blue, right? Because that's, they're not water. That's exactly right. Many people that do underwater photography keep it all blue, all swimming pool, all underwater. This is more like anti gravity, real life situations minus the gravity. And you call it wet. Wet. That's the series. The group of your ser <laughs> the series. It's called and wet. It, they're just was so much at your show with these underwater pictures that it was hard to believe. We had 32 images there. And I'm so glad you came on today and just showed us a little bit of what you did. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks, Gay Rabisi, <laughs> and thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles, and we'll see you next time, but keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017.